Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Science Behind Animal Behaviour webinar series, where we will be focusing on improving the welfare of dogs in shelters and homes. We are really pleased to have with us Dr. Alexandra or Sasha Protopopova as today's speaker for the webinar. Sasha is an assistant professor in the Animal Welfare Program at the University of British Columbia and the NSERC slash BC SDCA Industrial Research Chair in Animal Welfare. Her research seeks to learn more about dogs, improve animal shelter practices, improve companion animal welfare in shelters, pets in homes, and in assistant roles, all within a one welfare framework. Recently, she has been shifting her research focus on connecting climate change and other societal issues to companion animal welfare. Sasha earned an MSc and PhD in behavior analysis from the University of Florida with Drs. Clive Wayne and Brian Iwata. She spends her days conducting research, teaching university classes in animal learning and animal sheltering, going on hikes, trails, and cuddling dogs. We're really excited to have her with us today, and I'm sure all of you in this Zoom session are very keen to ask her questions. You may do so by typing into the chat box to the user named Q&A at any time during the session. A gentle reminder again to please mute your microphones as well. Thank you. Over to you, Sasha. Thank you so much, Audrey. Um, I'm very, very excited to be here. Um, I'm so excited that uh, with our new abilities in um, uh, using webinars and using uh, Zoom to talk to people all over the world. Um, this has enabled something like this, this kind of communication. So I'm very, very excited to be invited and um, get, get a chance to speak with you guys about my favorite topic. Um, as you heard from my uh, the lovely introduction, thank you, Audrey. Uh, my research interest and my obsession has been in dog behavior and dog welfare. And so with that, um, I was challenged uh, to come up with um, uh, a synthesis of research, both my own um, research from my colleagues in animal cognition and dog behavior, dog welfare, on uh, to try to answer or try to begin to answer the question of what is a happy dog and what do we actually do or how could we improve the welfare for dogs in all kinds of environments that we find that we care about our beloved dogs so much. Um, and so with that, I wanted to uh, put together a quick outline just because I feel that um, I'm going to be touching upon all kinds of different topics. And so this is just a little bit of a roadmap uh, for me primarily to make sure that I, we stay on the right track. So first, um, I want us to go through and really think about what is a dog. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. We'll go into the pet home. Uh, we'll talk about, do we know what dogs actually need in the pet home? Uh, and then we'll go into the sheltering. Uh, experience. Uh, we'll uh, take a look at how, how dogs may um, feel when they enter the shelter, um, thinking about individual differences. And finally, um, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my uh, quite old research at, the, uh, at this point on getting dogs out um, of animal shelters. And I think with all of this, um, I want us to start with um, something that you guys have probably have seen before. And these are five freedoms. And I have them um, for us in the very first slide, because this is when we're talking about welfare, um, a lot of us jump into the five freedoms. And the five freedoms that were developed uh, by Miller and other colleagues were, um, well, uh, synthesized later on, but ultimately were uh, actually developed much earlier in 1965 to really not talk about necessarily companion animals, but to think about from an agricultural perspective. And what are the minimums to, um, that we have that, um, to make sure that animals have good lives or at least not terrible lives? Uh, because of course this really came from agricultural context. And so there are five freedoms um, that um, have been um, put forward. And so those are freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, freedom to express normal behavior, and freedom from fear and distress. So I thought that this would be a very good place for us to start in our discussion of how can we ensure good welfare or happiness in our dogs. And so all of these make uh, quite a bit of sense. If you're looking through all these freedoms, certainly hunger and thirst, discomfort, injury, pain, disease, all of that makes sense. Fear and distress, um, fear and distress for sure is a bit more complicated to you. Um, uh, pinpoint exactly to determine this is a moment of uh, where fear and distress is happening, but even more complicated 
is this fourth freedom, freedom to express normal behavior. And this is where we're struggling as researchers. Um, and I suspect that you guys are struggling too as pet owners or people who are very interested in um, uh, companion behavior and dog behavior. If, what does a dog need to be happy? What are these normal behaviors that we're talking about? And so with that, this is where I wanted to start where um, perhaps we have to go back in history and get a sense of who is a dog, where did the dogs come from? So previous ideas that again, you may have already heard um, was that uh, dogs, of course, we all know were domesticated from wolves, but how did this actual process came about? Um, this old story that we um, used to tell in, 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 uh, to ourselves scientists, that perhaps it was something along the lines where um, early humans um, uh, found a wolf pup, took that wolf pup from a den, tamed that wild wolf, and throughout this kind of taming process, and perhaps later on selected breeding, we created a dog. Um, so in this sense, this old concept was that a dog is purely a human creation from the start and it's a human active creation. Um, and uh, here it is, there is some truth certainly to this where uh, we do know that the closest ancestor of a dog is the wolf. And of course, we also know that many other canids have some relation to our dog. Um, but now researchers are actually not so sure that this is exactly what happened. It may have been one component of the domestication process, but probably uh, the modern thinking is that something else happened, that it wasn't an active human activity whereby wild animals were tamed or wild wolves were tamed by taking those wolf pups, but instead it was a much more natural quote unquote, process. Um, it was, uh, it's almost as if dogs domesticated themselves in some way, rather than us actively engaging in the process of domestication. So what do I mean uh, by that is that uh, as humans settled, we've created a lot of um, uh, kind of side effects of our settlements. And the side effects are human garbage. And, in, and uh, this created a new ecological niche where there is now a new food resource. But this food resource is a bit dangerous, right? It's a bit, it's a bit risky for, uh, for animals to utilize because there's humans around it. But nevertheless, it created this new niche where the ancestors of our dogs um, were moved in, into this niche. And so these ancestors fed on that human garbage. And so in that way, uh, scientists are almost thinking that there is kind of this self-domestication aspect. And of course, later on, um, there was a mutual um, relationship uh, and so forth. And we'll talk about that. Uh, but at what point in time did dog domestication occur? And this is a bit more tricky to pinpoint exactly on the, the time uh, where it occurred. That's why I have that maybe in there. Uh, so for now, uh, we're thinking that perhaps it was something like 30,000 years ago, and again, maybe East Asia. Um, the ancestor is not a wolf, but it's an ancient wolf-like canid that is now extinct. Um, so this photo, of course, is not of that extinct animal. We don't have photos of that extinct animal. Um, uh, I put together a photo that maybe perhaps looks like that animal. Uh, this is the modern Asiatic gray wolf. Uh, but it's uh, important for us to remember that these are common ancestors. The dog did not evolve from the wolf. It's that the wolf and the modern dog had a common ancestor. Um, and uh, this graphic uh, I am certain now is uh, not up to date because every day I go um, look in the uh, new research that's been published on dog domestication. It seems like everything is always updating, getting um, uh, altered. We're finding out new information daily. Um, uh, but this is one um, hypothesis where uh, dogs have, uh, have been domesticated somewhere around 33,000 years ago in East Asia and then moved um, out into northern China and also migrated um, out of Asia into uh, later on Europe to thousand years ago, and then also walked um, then into North Africa and then also into the Americas. Um, and after, so these are natural populations of dogs who are moving not only um, actively with uh, humans taking those animals out, but also just with human settlements. As humans moved around the earth, that's exactly what dogs were doing. Um, and this is a graphic that, again, um, has been shared widely, and I'm certain that you guys have seen some parts of it. 
This is how um, scientists have now mapped different dog breeds to figure out how all of them are related to each other. So this is uh, research at Parker uh, on Stranger 2005, um, showing the relatedness between different breeds. And so you can see how um, some, uh, it is the case that some certain breeds are kind of have more uh, common genetic material with wolves than other breeds and others have more unique mutations and so forth. But I think one thing that this kind of infographic thinking about dog domestication misses is that this assumes that the dog you see in front of you or the dog that comes on the street or in the shelter has a breed and it's some kind of mix of whatever these breeds are. But in fact, the question I want us to ask ourselves is that does every dog you see have a breed? And we're used to uh, using certain language when it comes to dogs. When we see a dog that's not of an obvious breed, we tend to say it's a mixed breed. When we say it's a mixed breed, we're implying that there were uh, two purebred dogs that got together and created a mix of those two purebred dogs. And of course, then maybe uh, that mix uh, bred with another mix, but fundamentally we're saying that if we go further, far into the lineage of that dog, the dog has a purebred ancestor. But this is actually not the case. Um, you may be surprised that uh, when we're talking about dogs utilizing uh, human settlements uh, as a new niche for survival, that this is not actually just in the history of domestication of dogs, but it's actually in modern uh, times as well. In the current, um, uh, in our world at the moment, uh, estimates are um, that there's a right around 70 to 80% of the world's dog dogs are not in pet homes, are not in roles um, that we often imagine uh, our dogs being, such as in a pet, um, as a pet, as a, um, a working dog, as a, for example, a therapy dog. Um, that only, it, it, that's a minority of the dogs. The majority of the dogs are what we now call free ranging um, and free breeding dogs. So what I mean by that is that these dogs um, do not have people who are restricting their breeding so that they are um, breeding naturally around these human settlements. And this is uh, pretty striking to consider because this is really goes against what we frequently think about, that these uh, dogs are um, a purely human creation, that we've purposefully bred certain breeds for for something, for to, to do something for us. And that's also the case. But when we talk about that, we're talking about the minority of the dogs. And that dog that you see on the street, chances are, uh, it's actually not a mixed breed. It's just a dog. Uh, like, uh, very similar to when we see a cat, we're not imagining that every cat has purebred parents or grandparents or great grandparents. We just think that's a short coated cat or a long coated cat the same way dogs could just be dogs. And in fact, majority of dogs are dogs. Um, but that's not to say that they don't vary. Certainly dogs uh, vary a lot. And so these are images I pulled from uh, various newspapers in Russia, Thailand, Bahamas, and Morocco, where uh, there are um, large populations of free ranging dogs. And you can see just visually um, that there are different morphs. So we see um, that they do differ even in morphological features. Um, and so, and this is of course really, really curious for us. Um, researchers are now only starting to um, uh, think about these populations as naturally occurring populations um, of animals um, and uh, not only studying breed differences, which are also fascinating and, um, and are generating a lot of interesting data, but also are studying these natural populations of dogs and what are those differences in those populations of dogs, um, as well as mapping their uh, behavior to the genetics of these populations. But let's go back to um, our topic at hand, which is what, how do we improve the lives of these dogs? So now that we know um, who these dogs are from an evolutionary perspective, perhaps it's time to kind of consider um, what is their day-to-day -day life actually looking like? Uh, what about um, kind of what do they actually do? And so here uh, we luckily have uh, several research groups around the world studying free ranging dogs and they're studying free ranging dog behavior and their diet. Um, and uh, so we have a bit of knowledge about that. Unfortunately, not enough, uh, but certainly some. Uh, 
So one thing that we do know <laughs> is that dogs do tend to scavenge quite a bit on um, human leftovers. Um, that the food, the resources that are um, around in human settlements now, of course, cities um, uh, uh, generate that food. And so I'm showing data on the right. This is a graph from Butler et al. 2018 uh, that looked at um, collected feces of dogs, of free-ranging dogs, and looked at uh, what proportion of various ingredients uh, uh, were, were the components of those dogs' feces. Essentially, this is an, a clue into what the dog's diet was uh, when it defecated. And so here, um, uh, I think something that we will probably not be surprised by is that 50% of the percentage of mass came from mammal carcasses. I think this is something that we're, um, this is quite, quite obvious. These could be, um, uh, for example, uh, bones or meat that, that people give to dogs. It could be uh, maybe from some leftovers from a butcher. Um, it could even be a bit of hunting. Um, there is some research that shows that dogs do hunt just a little bit, not too much, um, but there's certainly some hunting going on um, uh, and a lot of scavenging. Uh, and another, uh, something that you guys will not be surprised by is the cooked grain. Uh, a lot of cultures will feed uh, dogs their leftover grains. So for example, um, uh, perhaps a person may make uh, rice and then that rice is not finished or, or perhaps there's some um, uh, kind of burnt uh, parts in the bottom. And so those will be dumped outside for the dogs to eat. Um, but one thing that I think you're looking at in that gray area, uh, which is quite, quite interesting, is that um, in this uh, population of dogs that was studied, 20% of the mass was actually due to eating consumption of human feces. Uh, themselves. And so um, later on, research shows that in fact, uh, human feces is a good source of protein for dogs. And so this is just, this is not at all to tell, um, tell us that dog food, modern dog food should consist of these ingredients, um, but it is a nice way to uh, show that uh, dogs are utilizing humans as this uh, dietary niche uh, that we are supplying. Uh, and um, uh, that perhaps dogs also have a role as scavengers in, in cleanup. And so it generates a lot of new interesting research ideas. And also a nice um, uh, reminder for us not to get too upset with our pet dog when they go after uh, certain ingredients on the streets, um, because <laughs> mentally that is their, um, their natural food. Uh, we also know a little bit about their um, social behavior and communication as they navigate this free ranging environment. Uh, we know that free living dogs do form loose groups. We call them packs when we talk about dogs. Um, but I think there is also a lot of misconceptions, especially uh, in some dog training circles, that um, there are some certainly like pack mentality or there's some kind of static pack conditions. Um, but it seems like these dominance hierarchies are actually quite poorly established in dogs compared to um, uh, many other social species. Um, they do have uh, moderately advanced social behavior. And what I mean by moderately advanced social behavior here, I am comparing to wolves. Um, uh, researchers who've compared uh, aggression uh, levels, for example, between wolf packs um, and dog packs have found that in wolf packs, aggression uh, tends to be lower. There tends to be a lot of conflict resolution, whereas with dogs, and that's something you see with high um, aspects of social behavior because fighting is a class right of we don't want um, fighting in groups, uh, whereas in dogs, you do see more fighting than you would expect. And so that's, uh, that's that comparison, um, especially that fighting happens around resources and male-to-male um, -male aggression around breeding time. Um, oh, one thing that is particularly striking about dogs that is less striking about other, even urban animals, is that they're so sensitive to human behavior. Now, researchers uh, from several groups, um, especially in India at the moment, from um, Dr. Ananya Badra, um, their lab has shown that free-ranging dogs in India are able to um, solve very complex cognitive problems. Um, they're able to follow human points. They're able to engage with people, even when they're living in these free-ranging environments. And so this question of why are these free-ranging dogs uh, are so sensitive to human behavior? Well, here, um, uh, uh, there's been a lot of thought um, about this. 
And in fact, the consensus at the moment of the researchers is that it, it seems like dog's evolutionary strategy absolutely involves people. So there's, um, so I'm going to put together some interesting tidbits of previous data that uh, we know that dams um, leave their pups right around six to eight weeks of age. Um, so there's not, so, so dogs, unlike um, other um, uh, wolves, for example, or other um, uh, um, many other species, they don't stay too long with their, um, with their offspring. So right around six to eight weeks of age, dams will leave. Um, and at this point, uh, we also know that mortality is very high for those pups. So 70% of pups will um, uh, die before they reach 10 weeks of age, and 80% will die before one year. So mortality is very high uh, in these free-ranging dog populations. But curiously, uh, my previous uh, supervisor, uh, Dr. Clive Wynn, he did a study um, with um, his, uh, an undergraduate student at the time, uh, who was a breeder who supplied these adorable photos, who had contact with breeders who could supply these adorable photos of dogs at various stages of development. And they had the um, interesting question of, is, is it the case that perhaps dogs are fundamentally using humans for their survival? Um, and they asked participants to rank the cuteness, um, or in some way, how much would you uh, like to help the dog or save the dog, kind of the cuteness at what age you will find. And um, unsurprisingly, probably because you guys are already also um, noticing this, that right around six to eight weeks of age, puppies are very, very cute. Um, and we have a hard time ignoring puppies <laughs> that are at this age, very, very cute. And so perhaps it's an evolutionary strategy of dogs. This is what they hypothesized to actually um, that they're, um, why we cannot say no to them is that we, they are actually using our, um, uh, uh, this mechanism to uh, reduce mortality. However, uh, humans are not all uh, uh, easy for dogs. There's also some evolutionary cost um, in utilizing this human niche for dogs. Um, and in fact, if you look at mortalities of free ranging dogs, 63% uh, of those mortalities, um, in this case in India, um, uh, are human caused. So uh, human caused being the um, active injury, active death, um, um, and so on. And so there is certainly uh, a risk uh, that uh, as a species, dogs uh, need to take into account when they are utilizing this human niche. Also in the modern sense, curiously, there's a different kind of risk um, that we certainly in the applied world, uh, when we're dealing with dogs and, and dog welfare, we never think about that as an evolutionary uh, risk. But spay neuter programs, um, they actually are tricky from an evolutionary perspective because ultimately reproduction is something that is um, important to the species. Um, and uh, this association with humans has those evolutionary uh, costs through that spay neuter programs. Um, so that's just an interesting philosophical perspective there. But all of that direct connection to humans um, uh, has led dogs to develop uh, from an early age, from puppyhood, these highly developed socio-cognitive abilities. So much so that uh, plenty of researchers, myself included, really focus on understanding the cognition of dogs uh, because it is so fascinating, especially social cognition. And uh, dogs seem to outperform even primates in their abilities to understand uh, various human gestures, uh, various um, uh, perspective taking um, and kind of utilizing human communication. Uh, and perhaps all of this is because um, uh, we are fundamentally part of their evolutionary history in both natural selection and then of course, artificial selection. So here we are back again with the five freedoms. Um, have we learned anything about this number four, this fourth freedom of express normal behavior? Um, and here I wanted us to go into the natural history of dogs because perhaps we can get a bit of a hint of what, what do we mean by normal behavior? Do we mean these species specific behaviors that we can observe and learn from free ranging dogs? Um, however, I have a feeling because I had the same feeling in that, well, right, we have free ranging dogs, but certainly my purebred, I have an Australian Shepherd who's sitting right here, um, he is different than a free ranging dog. Can I really learn um, anything about whether he is happy uh, by studying free ranging dogs? 
And this is a really, really good question. Um, and something only now started to consider. Um, uh, there is a, a very new study uh, just a couple years ago, uh, Lazzarini and colleagues, um, who've utilized a very interesting uh, way to study dogs and to kind of compare different populations of dogs to try to get at those kinds of questions. Um, uh, they, uh, this is a, um, uh, this research is part of the Wolf Science Center, um, where they raise um, uh, wolves and dogs in very similar conditions, of course, separated. Uh, but here they're um, able to compare wolf uh, populations to dog populations raised under similar conditions. But this also allows them, um, aside from the dog to wolf comparison, it also allows them to compare different populations of dogs themselves. And so that research group has recently also, not recently, but have, throughout the years have now started also um, looking at um, uh, behavior of free ranging dogs in Morocco and comparing the cognitive abilities um, of these free ranging dogs to pet dogs and then also pack living dogs in this wolf science center um, that are raised kind of quote unquote in captivity um, in the sense of um, they are living very much like a wolf type lifestyle. Um, and so they asked a question on, um, are these dogs different in uh, uh, certain cognitive ability? And the cognitive ability they were very um, particularly focused on was persistence. Uh, and persistence is an interesting um, behavioral variable. It has been um, implicated in lots of other types of cognitions, um, even in um, uh, uh, obsessive compulsive behavior in humans. And so um, this persistence um, in is, is an interesting kind of fundamental difference in behavior that could be very interesting to assess. Um, and what I mean by persistence is, uh, is will you, um, uh, how long will you continue to um, uh, work on a task that perhaps is not paying you back um, with what you're trying to get at? So this persistence is measured in many different ways, but uh, one of the very kind of, um, popular ways, and especially in animal cognition research, is to is an unsolvable task. So this is a task where a container is provided to an animal, to a dog, and that container has some food inside. And before in pre-training trials, that food, you can actually get that food. Uh, but during test trials, you lock the container and the dog cannot actually get to it. And then the measure is how long will they persist in that behavior. Again, to try to get a sense of, are there some underlying behavioral differences in these populations? And so um, uh, Lazzarini and colleagues, interestingly, when they compare these populations of dogs, they found very few differences across the populations. But they did find that free ranging dogs um, did seem to persist uh, less rather than more. Uh, here, this is, this is data showing proportion of individuals that manipulated, in this case, was a ball task um, in three groups. And so you're looking at the free ranging dogs in Morocco, the pet dogs, and then the wolf science center, the pack living dogs. And so here, what you're looking at is that while pet dogs and um, the dogs li living in packs in the wolf science center, uh, most of those dogs did manipulate um, the container, the free ranging dogs, not um, uh, quite a few of them manipulated and, um, and the persistence was lower. So there's an interesting, the, the group concluded that perhaps this was not a difference of uh, fundamental differences like in the genetic um, behavioral differences in these populations, but rather on the experiences of these dogs where um, the free ranging dogs, perhaps even though they have access to human containers, um, they also will move uh, from one area to another area. Whereas the pet dogs, um, are more used to persisting on this one particular container. So they hypothesize that perhaps this is not necessarily a difference in populations, um, uh, but probably on the life experience. But as you can see how we have so many more questions that remain, which is such an exciting avenue for research. Now, a totally different kind of uh, research, trying to get at the same question of, is there a difference between free ranging dogs and our pet dogs? Um, this is, um, uh, we have a new collaboration with my lab um, and the lab in um, Kolkata run by Dr. Badra. This is Dr. Rubina Mantal, who's a postdoc in Kolkata. Um, and uh, she is very interested in understanding whether free ranging dogs can be adopted out into pet homes. 
Um, and fundamentally, that does uh, allow us to get a bit of the question of, are there some differences between free-ranging dogs and our pet dogs? And so this is completely fresh data. Um, thank you to Dr. Rabina and Dr. Badra for allowing uh, me to share with you guys for this presentation. Um, so this is um, CBARC data. So CBARC is a questionnaire uh, that is administered to owners um, of dogs. In this case, um, this is a questionnaire that, that was administered to adopters of free-ranging dogs in India. So these are um, people who've adopted either from the street and directly from the street or from rescue organizations, um, dogs who uh, have a documented history of being a free-ranging dog in India. Um, and this questionnaire has been validated to uh, get a sense of what are some typical problem behaviors that the dogs are experiencing. And of course, the, um, the fear that we have um, and I think, uh, I'm, again, I'm quite certain that you guys share and that Rabina shared, is that perhaps when we're adopting out these dogs from a free-ranging environment to a home environment, there may be more challenges in the home environment because these dogs are not used to living with people or at least in confined areas, kind of what are the issues? And so here, uh, what you're seeing is uh, on the y-axis, it's a score, and on the x-axis, I know it's very difficult to read, I apologize, it's so small, um, but all of these different kinds of um, uh, categories that the questionnaire is asking about. So, uh, for example, how, how attached you are, how, um, uh, or attachment problem behavior, I apologize, how excitable the dog is, if there's any owner-directed aggression and so forth. So, of course, by itself, this is very difficult to interpret and doesn't really tell us much. But luckily, um, just um, uh, very, very recently, Paul and colleagues actually uh, published the paper that utilized the CBARC in um, adopted um, uh, pet dogs, um, uh, uh, not from free ranging. And here, um, just very roughly, again, this is a very, very fresh data. Um, so this actually has to be analyzed properly <laughs> rather than me putting boxes on the slides. Um, but here I put in um, uh, right around the averages, uh, sorry, the medians, of the various um, uh, categories of scores um, on the pet um, uh, on the pet dogs compared to the previously free ranging dogs. And you can see how they're kind of similar. Uh, the only difference that I see here is the trainability. We'll of course have to run some statistical analysis to determine if there are any differences. Um, but ultimately it seems really, really similar, which is really surprising to us. Not so surprising for Rubina. Um, she has been um, advocating for uh, the consideration of free-ranging dogs' um, welfare in this sense, uh, but certainly surprising for the rest of us who thought that there may have been some differences. Um, but fundamentally, uh, well, we're coming to the conclusion, I think a, a lot of people, a lot of researchers are starting to think that um, we really are dealing with dogs or dogs. Of course, we have some artificial selection now. We have um, specifically targeted specific genes, um, of course, behavioral genes as well, uh, or uh, genes that are responsible for some aspects of behavior, as well as morphological aspects. But ultimately, pet dogs are the same species as free ranging dogs. And the differences there are in socialization, not so much in the biology, um, when it comes to needs. Certainly, again, this is not to say that certain very specialized breeds have those behavioral needs that we all know. We know the breed-specific behaviors. But fundamentally, a dog is a dog that needs things that uh, a dog needs. And now thinking from this kind of very, um, uh, pers this perspective that dog is, the dog is the animal that we have to learn something more about, um, we had a chance to um, uh, break open what I kind of like to think about are my uh, ethnocentric or Western, Western think, uh, centered thinking surrounding dog welfare and what the dog needs. Uh, we had a chance to uh, conduct the study um, again, with uh, in collaboration with Dr. Rabina Mandal, uh, run by my undergraduate student, um, highly talented student, Avika, um, who interviewed uh, uh, animal shelter staff in India in various animal caretaking roles, manager roles. Um, uh, this is a qualitative analysis where we asked many different questions around shelter practices, um, fundamentally with uh, uh, trying to get more information about animal sheltering in the global south, because uh, at the moment, 
um, all of the research that we have out in the literature is about the global north. Um, so we wanted to, our, our primary uh, goal of this research was to get just more information um, into the published literature. But one, uh, as part of the interviews, uh, one um, uh, curious question we decided to ask, and I'm so happy we did, um, was um, to ask the staff um, of if we had an ideal world, uh, what do you think um, dogs need in the ideal world? And here the answers were very striking, again, from my uh, Western perspective, from my kind of ethnocentric perspective, um, where um, uh, almost uh, all of the uh, participants mentioned that dogs need autonomy and freedom of movement. This was especially true um, when people were talking about free ranging dogs, but it also translated into all dogs, that dogs fundamentally need to lead a life for themselves, for the sake of their own life. And so um, this was really striking because these words like autonomy, freedom of movement, um, uh, uh, are not really in the discourse um, in the global North. Um, and in fact, uh, this is quite different from our, um, uh, our thinking in the literature of, kind of what I call the Western pet keeping. Uh, we certainly have nearly no death nor injury as compared to a uh, free range dog situation. Um, but we focus so much on the restraint uh, to, to ensure that we have no death and injury that uh, we really focus on this complete control. Uh, we control feeding, we control sleeping, we control social interactions, we certainly control breeding. Um, and whereas um, in India from the participants reflected certainly that breeding needs to be controlled, um, no one actually talked uh, about controlling any other aspects of, of the animal. And in fact, they were focused on more on the autonomy, providing more autonomy to the animal where they can. Um, and speaking uh, about this kind of cultural perspectives on what is important to animals, we are surprised um, and, and collective we, I think the more we talk about um, with dog researchers, I think the, the more everyone kind of has the same feeling of surprise where um, how much cultural perspectives actually matter when we decide to worry about welfare, when we think about welfare, um, that we are clouded by our cultural judgments and whatever those are. Uh, so for example, um, uh, again, my previous supervisor, Dr. Clive Wynn, um, often talks about him traveling to the Bahamas and, um, and uh, uh, owners there talking about how, how cruel it would be to put your dog in a crate and um, your dog must be very lonely and so forth. And so again, kind of highlighting that it's quite difficult to pinpoint exactly what a dog means because we are humans trying to um, understand the dog from that perspective. But now that we kind of have this, these perspectives from the various cultures, is it possible to reconcile the two and actually get at both of those things? Because certainly none of us will be comfortable saying, okay, this just means we have to um, open up all our shelters, open up our homes, and now we have dogs on, on the street, more dogs. Um, uh, no one will say that's particularly a good thing because of course we don't want injury. We don't want um, uh, this death. We don't want that mortality that I showed you. Um, that was uh, 80 to 90% mortality of free ranging dogs. And so how can we put together this need for autonomy and movement, uh, freedom movement together with this reduction of injury. And, um, and again, here we have no, um, uh, uh, we don't actually have clear uh, research on this particular point, but I think this is where um, dog welfare researchers are moving towards this kind of understanding of how do we put those two things together. And um, I pulled out a couple of themes that um, are prevalent in the literature um, surrounding these ideas where one, this concept of freedom of movement, um, uh, again, from um, studying natural populations of free-ranging dogs is coming into play. Um, what that mean, kind of how that translates, what we're seeing in the, in the um, dog training world is that people may be using uh, long lines, for example, for allowing more movement. Um, uh, this concept of maybe a dog, uh, you shouldn't be dragging your dog on the walk, but instead um, allow your dog to guide the walk, to explore, um, to kind of have that freedom to, to move. Um, another aspect is this um, understanding of opportunity for social interaction. And here we don't necessarily mean that every dog needs a, um, a, a dog friend. Uh, we all know again that uh, not all dogs actually enjoy dog friends, but nevertheless, can we provide or can we consider these needs uh, for social interaction? 
Uh, another theme uh, um, generally in animal welfare is now providing more choice, um, doing preference assessments. Um, um, how can we find a way to allow to have dogs to have more choice in their everyday lives, um, perhaps even in uh, participating in um, uh, grooming, for example, not that we're just imposing ourselves on the dogs, not just to uh, building tolerance uh, for uh, grooming activities, like husbandry activities, but in instead asking the dogs to engage with us and provide consent and, and so forth. Um, and then also finally, this focus on positive reinforcement-based training, um, simply to remove potential aversives from the dog's lives. Uh, but here, one thing that's quite interesting is that um, uh, beyond, um, so uh, I'm a behavior analyst, um, and as part of the a behavior analyst, we focus not only on the method by which we get to a behavior, but we also have a question of, does it matter which behavior we train? And a lot of the times our target behaviors that we train, even if it's a, with a clicker, um, it's positive reinforcement based training, but we train behaviors that are very controlling. Like for example, the dog is in a heel position continuously and so forth. Of course, the dog is choosing that because we have food and has been trained with food. Um, but nevertheless, um, here we're moving to thinking about, well, could we train, of course, with positive reinforcement, target behaviors that are not only useful for the owner, but are also useful for the dog. So for example, developing their uh, uh, feelings of self-efficacy um, uh, and so forth, kind of their ability to deal with problems on their own, or we teach them very similar to how we would teach children rather than focusing on this kind of what the owner needs in that moment. So these are not so much on the scientific side, but this is me connecting, um, because I'm also a dog trainer, connecting um, the training field together with how researchers and animal welfare are coming together. So I think there's um, a lot of parallels that we see between um, uh, dog training and animal welfare researchers in these topics. Um, but this is, uh, we've talked more about kind of what are dogs, what do dogs need theoretically, but what about actually directly in an animal shelter? Um, I spent uh, all of my uh, time um, as a researcher um, studying animal sheltering. And here, uh, uh, there's certainly, it's, it's very, I, I very much believe that it's very important to understand uh, who is a dog from an evolutionary perspective, what are the needs of dogs? But here we also want to get at the, what is the experience of the individual dog and how does that matter? And here I'm moving back into the five freedoms um, that I've showed before, but there is actually a problem with this, with these five freedoms. They actually don't um, capture the subtleties uh, when it comes to kenneling animals or kind of uh, putting animals into, it, it, keeping animals captive. And this is what I mean by that. If I show you these three photos um, and you imagine yourself um, inside the environments of these photos. So one is a prison cell, one is a dorm room of a university, for example, and one is a hotel room. You can feel you have a different emotional state. Um, I suppose, I hope <laughs> if, if you're like me, you have a different emotional state uh, or different feelings associated with these photos, um, hopefully not from personal experiences. Um, but nevertheless, you imagine that the prison cell would be probably a much less comforting environment than a hotel room and so on. And so of course you have differences in the environment where there's fabrics, there's kind of all kinds of things, but fundamentally I put this up here because I want to show you that the five freedoms as we've conceptualized are not actually um, adequate for us to explain the differences we have in that emotion associated with the different images. All of these do in fact satisfy the five freedoms, but they feel different. And you might suspect that a human will have different welfare uh, states in the various um, environments. And so with that, uh, now 2017, along with other colleagues um, after that, updated the um, five freedoms into a different kind of conceptual framework, which is the five domains. And here in the five domains, um, you still have aspects of those five freedoms, but they're conceptualized quite differently and much more new in a much more nuanced way to really account for that animal's mental state or the emotional environment or the emotional um, aspects of the animal to really get a sense that the, the uh, researchers now should not just be checking out boxes that is the animal hungry, is the animal thirsty, is the animal in pain, but really getting it, trying to get a sense of the, the effective state, the emotional state of the animal, and how do we get there? And so in this sense, um, the welfare in a shelter uh, 
um, is quite different in the home environment in the sense that there could be some emotional states associated when we kind of take the perspective of a dog coming into a shelter. And if you imagine if you're a dog, uh, this is where I'm comfortable anthropomorphizing a bit or putting um, kind of imagining um, if you were the animal coming into the shelter, what kinds of um, feelings will you have? So dogs, when they come into the shelter, they're experiencing all kinds of disruptions to their environment. Uh, perhaps they were taken away from a home or, or even from a, if it's a, a free ranging dog or a stray dog or a lost dog, um, they had that autonomy, they had that freedom movement, they were captured, restrained and put into um, a, a captive environment where the, it may be cold, it may be very loud, very, very scary with other dogs barking. Um, the environment might be um, uh, um, kind of everything is sanitized, but with that sanitation comes those um, the odors of disinfectants and so forth. And of course, fundamentally, they are missing their attachment figure. If uh, most dogs will come into the shelter from a previous home or with some attachment to people, they have not no attachment. So they are alone, placed alone. And all of this leads to a stress response. So this is data uh, from 1997. Um, this is early data by Hennessy's group, Hennessy et al., um, that showed that um, uh, how stressed dogs are when they come into the shelter. So this is the days in shelter. And on the y-axis, you're looking at plasma cortisol. And cortisol is a stress hormone. Um, actually, I'll go into the next slide to show you what cortisol is. Um, so uh, cortisol is part of the HPA system. It's essentially if something scary jumps at you and immediately... Um, you have the um, uh, you have this ability to either fight or run away, and so that's when you feel that, that kind of um, uh, feeling. That's actually your cortisol going up, and so you feel that hormone. and And that hormone cortisol has certain um, uh, aspects that kind of it, there, it's there for a reason, and it's there to allow you to fight or to run away. And it turns off all of the things that are unnecessary in that moment to run away or fight. So, for example, your digestion that's not important as you're running away. Um, and also your immune system, which of course is very relevant for a sheltering uh, system. But here, going back to that slide where um, you can see how the cortisol is elevated in the first few days of the shelter, and then it does slowly decrease, but fundamentally it does not go to uh, at-home levels. Um, so um, dogs are have that elevated stress hormone um, when they enter the shelter. And this, this, early, this is an early study I'm showing, but this is of course has been repeated over and over again. Um, by lots of researchers. And so um, uh, I mentioned that one of the effects of cortisol in the fight or flight system is that you have a suppression of immune system function. And um, this is dangerous because in a shelter environment, we're particularly worried about infectious disease uh, and we certainly don't want um, immune system function. And so I'll come back to that in, uh, when I talk about uh, different research that we'll be covering. Um, but here, this is where, um, now that we know that kind of the experience of the dog, that everything is quite stressful, they're physiologically stressed, the cortisol is up, they're in that acute stress response. Um, and so when you think about a dog entering the shelter, um, and what can we do to make their life better, um, the purpose of enrichment and what I mean by enrichment, and if this is a word you've heard before, is kind of putting objects into kennels or kind of uh, uh, giving something extra. And I mean, I mean that because enrichment actually doesn't have a very clear definition in the sense of that's, that I'm quite comfortable with. And I'll get to that in a second. But typically, enrichment is like giving things to the animal to make them feel better. And so if the function of enrichment, we have to actually know what the dog is experiencing. And if those immediate needs when the dog enters the shelter they're in that acute stress response. So we need things that will reduce that acute stress. So imagine if you're bringing a dog to the veterinarian or the groomer the first time, they will have that acute stress response. So these are the same kinds of things that the dog will need at that moment, um, where the focus should be on comfort, reassurance, gentle handling. I'm also, um, we're studying the use of anxiolytic medication at intake to reduce that stress response to help support the animal um, in that acute stressor. Um, now, as the animal stays longer, you remember that the cortisol goes down, but there's also actually a problem of chronic stress. If uh, an animal or human is chronically stressed, what can happen is that this uh, feedback loop that I have in the diagram actually is malfunctions. And so you can actually have, um, even though cortisol goes down, but the feedback loop is broken. 
and your immune system goes even lower and lower where you cannot handle any more stress. So this is why um, human doctors, for example, uh, focus so much on reducing stress um, that we um, just to, to improve our health. And so this is that chronic stress. And, and likewise, in the shelter environment, um, we have to worry about that chronic stress in our animals. And so those long-term needs um, do, of course, uh, require us to prevent chronic stress, but also occasionally relieve boredom if it's already at that point. But relieving boredom is not important at that early stage because the animals are in such acute stress responses. Um, and so um, uh, I wanted to go in uh, quickly about why I don't really like the term enrichment, because it feels like you're just adding stuff and it doesn't help you realize kind of what is the purpose of that stuff. And so I think um, I, I'm, I'm uh, arguing for us to switch our words around to help us uh, really focus in on what do we actually mean by when we're talking about providing support. And I think what we mean is that we want to provide this mental health support, uh, prevent trauma from entering that shelter, safeguard mental health as the animal stays in the shelter. And I think that helps us put it more clearly of what exactly we're needing to do for our animals. And what I mean by that is that once we think about those needs, this kind of enrichment that we often see in the shelter becomes rather funny. For example, uh, one um, uh, enrichment type that I like to, um, uh, well, I, I, I like to dislike um, <laughs> publicly is blowing bubbles in the dog's face. Um, this is of course something that is um, interesting to some dogs. Um, but what I, but my problem is not uh, that that's a bad thing, not at all. It's, it's that I think we're trying to make dogs think things are interesting when their needs are um, sleep, reduction of stress. Um, they are not necessarily interested in more kind of more activity, more interest. I think we forget a lot about this kind of more um, allowing them to distress this gentle, gentle touching, social interactions with humans. Um, really focusing on those particular points. I'm not going to go into very specific research on each enrichment item. Um, I, I have a feeling that you guys may have other speakers who are going to be talking about very specific um, data on, um, on such uh, enrichment um, things, but if not, I put in um, a paper that we wrote that is a review, and there's been reviews about uh, dog enrichment, but overall, um, these are the things that have limited evidence that they are in fact useful um, in the grand scheme of things. But I think again, because we are, um, uh, we forget what is the purpose of enrichment. What are we actually doing? Um, uh, and also on the individual level. And this takes me to the point of individual consideration. So when I have that graph of cortisol, um, this is aggregated data across all of the dogs, but not everyone will experience the same stress the same way. And we know that from humans, from ourselves, um, that we have different kinds of um, different abilities to cope with stress. And in animal uh, behavior, we call that stress reactivity or coping ability, cognitive style emotionality. So we have all kinds of different words depending on the field of, um, that you're studying. Uh, but this connection between the stress immune function and illness um, uh, has uh, been well studied in humans. And um, I think I'm gonna, this is an exciting study, but I think I'm gonna skip it in the, um, because of time. I realized that I'm a little bit behind schedule. I love the talking about these things, so I get carried away. Um, but I wanna uh, jump into that individual differences um, uh, point. So we had a chance in Texas, um, in a Texas shelter where there was an, um, uh, a difficult environment where um, infectious disease was rampant um, and where we saw a lot of disease in the shelter environment. What you're looking at here is at the, um, by the time the dog stays around seven days or actually even um, two to three days, um, they already 40% of the dogs have a fever. Um, uh, a lot are coughing, a lot are um, have nasal discharge, eye discharge. So all of these are um, uh, implicated in um, upper respiratory infections. Um, uh, and also distemper and power. So there, this shelter had a lot of different um, um, infectious diseases rampant. Within that, it was a very sad situation, um, uh, but, uh, well, there's no bad, it was a very sad situation. We were there trying to improve um, the conditions, but while we were doing so, um, we took a look at the uh, uh, behavioral behaviors of those animals. And so we did behavioral assessments with the dogs um, and looked at progression of disease, progression of illness to 
um, get a sense of, do we see those individual differences in uh, stress reactivity when they're entering that shelter environment? Um, and can we predict how sick they will get based on that behavior of intake? And we did actually find that, of course, time in the shelter was the biggest predictor of illness, but still curiosity, sociability, um, and somewhat anxiety um, uh, in the q and I can talk more about this, the, the, what we mean by that, uh, all predicted the time to progression. And so um, we did find that dogs exhibiting a certain combination of alert behaviors uh, were at higher risk of illness. Um, and so what this highlighted is that you are uh, worried about individual differences in how dogs are stressed in the shelter, whether they're doing okay, whether they're not doing okay. And so this is where, um, uh, of course, not all shelter facilities have the capacity to provide individualized care, but this is where um, uh, I think we're moving towards that understanding that um, uh, we need to really try to focus on that individual as well, while we're trying to protect the population, worry about population health at the same time. But my um, interest has also been not uh, only on helping dogs deal with the stress of, of entering a, a novel um, environment like an animal shelter, but also thinking about the long-term welfare of these animals. And for me, the long-term welfare, the best thing to do is to get those animals out of the shelter. Fundamentally, leaving the shelter is the first, is, is the point, is why the shelters exist. And so for this reason, I spent all of my, um, uh, all my PhD work is actually on figuring out um, what people want in dogs um, with the hope that we can train dogs to engage in certain behaviors to improve their adoption. So this is a photo from the Florida shelter where I was when I was a graduate student. And through a series of studies, um, we followed people as they made decisions about it um, and figured out what are the behaviors that mattered to people. And, um, I have a video here. Um, actually, I should probably explain what, the, what this is. So, um, so we found that um, when people are selecting dogs in the kennel, so when they're walking these kennels, they really are not focusing on behavior. Um, they really are focusing on the morphological features. So if a dog is long-coated, small, a puppy, uh, purebred, so these are the features that are really, um, uh, that people like, um, but behavior, seems to matter much less. However, when a person selects a dog they like, then they take them out for further inspection in this meet and greet area. But, and what we found is that there are some behaviors during that meet and greet that did predict uh, adoption likelihood. So here is a video. Um, it's a natural uh, situation of a meet and greet where the adopter is trying to engage with the dog by play and the dog very actively ignores uh, any attempts at play initiation by the adopter. Certainly the adopter um, is not uh, so this is a bit of a joke video, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately the dog uh, did not get adopted following this interaction. And so what we learned from watching these videos is that there, there were two behaviors that seemed to matter to adopters. One was if a dog agreed to play with the person. So the person offered a play initiation, so they would toss the ball and the person would, oh, sorry, and the dog would reciprocate, actually follow that ball or um, really engage in that play. And the other behavior was that if a dog laid down in proximity to the person, um, this increased adoption. And so what this led us um, to design an experimental study where we uh, modeled the correct meet and greet. Uh, this was an experimental petition to see if we could improve outcomes following these meet and greets. And so this is what that looked like. We called it the Structured Adopter Dog Interaction Program. Um, uh, this is me as a uh, graduate student in Florida. And uh, this is not an adopter. This is actually an, uh, an undergraduate student who was helping me at the time. Uh, but here we would uh, lead the potential adopter into a meet and greet area that was smaller. Uh, we did know that this dog preferred play with this particular toy. So we knew that the dog would not ignore the initiation of play um, at this point. So then I would model, so instead of training the dog, I would model the correct play to the potential adopter. I would say, this is a really good uh, toy for this dog. Now you try, and I would verbally encourage the adopter to actually engage and play with the, with the dog. At some point, oh, and uh, if the preference assessment revealed that the dog did not play with toys because dogs are quite stressed in the shelter and uh, a lot of them will not play with toys, uh, we uh, just toss the treat and say, the dog loves the find it game. 
and you can uh, toss the treat on the dog comes and they seem to work well. When the adopter tried to pet the dog, we would then lead the adopter and the dog uh, to a bench and keep that proximity next to the adopter um, to encourage that behavior of laying down in proximity. You can see how I'm also uh, providing treats to the dog uh, and to the adopter to ensure that the dog has that connection with the adopter. Um, so this is gonna show off just a cute couple more behaviors. All right, just for the sake of time, I'll move around. Okay, so, um, and from all of my research and several studies, I have a feeling that people really want to feel selected by the dog. And this is why those two behaviors are important, it's laying down in proximity and not ignoring play initiation. So to summarize all of these kind of desperate uh, pieces of information of what does it all mean? I think one thing, um, it means that it's really difficult to actually figure out how to make our dogs happy. And this is why we don't have a straight answer. We don't just have them just do this and, and we'll be fine. But I think one thing we can do is consider the evolutionary niche of dogs, consider what do we mean by natural behavior and fundamentally also consider what the dog experiences. What is that emotional state when they enter the shelter and what can we do to mitigate that emotional state? Uh, from the individual perspective. So this is the full summary that we covered. What is a dog? We went into the pet home. Um, what about how do we reconcile those needs of autonomy and bodily safety in um, thinking about entering the shelter? How do we mitigate that distress um, with functional enrichment and thinking about those individual differences um, and finally getting dogs out? And so um, I would like to thank you guys uh, uh, very much for listening, for, um, uh, uh, for allowing me to present uh, my research and also synthesize the research of all of my colleagues in dog cognition and behavior. And uh, um, I look forward to the uh, question and answer. Thank you so much, Sasha, for your sharing. Uh, it was really, really insightful and interesting. And I'm sure many of us learned a lot about the origin and welfare needs of dogs. Now we will open the floor to the Q&A and a very big thank you to everyone who has sent in your questions. Uh, due to a shortage of time, we might not be able to get through to all of them uh, and I apologize in advance. Um, now we'll start off with the first question. Um, while breed may be a modern construct, uh, do dogs from land races across the geographical range uh, differ and do their welfare needs differ? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic question. Um, we don't know. <laughs> this is exactly the question um, that some research groups are, are um, taking a look at. Um, uh, there's surprisingly in some way, there's generally not a whole lot of, um, there's only a few research groups around the world who study free ranging dog behavior, natural dog behavior. Um, and at the moment, I know there is a collaboration in place um, to try to um, assemble that data to see, to try to find those um, uh, differences, geographic differences. So for example, um, this is because in some, uh, uh, some so even the diet, uh, the diet research um, by Butler et al um, on the composition where there was a large um, proportion of human feces, which is so, so striking for all of us, um, uh, now, if we look at the diet of dogs in India and free-ranging dogs, that has not been observed. Um, and so even the dietary choices could be different. Um, another example of this is previous research has um, uh, really clearly demonstrated that um, uh, fathers do not play any parental roles um, in um, free-ranging dogs. But new research says, no, actually, the, the father does play a role and they do provide some uh, resources. And so, so this makes us think that, well, perhaps there are actual differences that maybe we can't lump all dogs into one. Yep, thank you so much. Um, the next question is, does the survivability of pups after six to eight weeks increase when they are adopted compared to remaining as free-ranging dogs? Uh, necessarily, certainly, certainly. Yep. Um, it's um, so th those data are from uh, free ranging populations. Um, now, um, uh, I don't have the data of if one were to take um, a pup, what is the average survival rate? Of course, we're dealing with different infectious diseases. Um, so, primarily, um, what, what the people do is that they provide medical care um, and they provide continuous food sources and protection from, from others. And so, um, so certainly um, all of you guys who have fostered um, litters 
uh, we'll note that there is some uh, mortality certainly associated with infectious disease, um, uh, but but it's it's much higher than ninety percent, right? So um, so certainly. Okay, thank you. The next question is, um, is there is a myth that free-ranging dogs are genetically wired to be more aggressive or have mm -hmm. behavioral problems uh, compared to pet dogs. Uh, so could these behavioral traits actually be genetically passed down from generation to generation? Um, also very interesting. And I'm, and I'm sorry to say we have no data again. <laughs> on these, but this is exactly the, the question. What are these differences? Are, so even if, so it seems like the differences are not so great, but if there are differences, um, how do we attribute those? And of course, we're going back to the nature versus nurture debate. Um, that's the classic debate of, is it the upbringing? Is it the socialization? Or is it some genetic aspect? And we know the answer has to be both. It can never be one or the other. Um, that's always the answer is it depends and it's both. Um, and so in this sense, um, there certainly could be a clear um, evolutionary strategy in place for avoiding people or being more cautious around people because again um, people do present some risk to uh, free ranging dog populations um, and so so that could be a logical outcome but uh, this research on comparing free ranging dogs to pet dogs is so so new um, that uh, we would have to we'll, we'll just have to uh, stick around for a decade to see uh, how that research develops Thank you. Okay, so the next question is, um, given that welfare needs are largely championed by the global north, uh, could our understanding of dogs' welfare be biased toward a westernized culture? And how important is it to incorporate other cultural perspectives? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, very important. Um, so this is, of course, me speaking about uh, my own opinion at this point. Um, um, although there is research, um, that does suggest that incorporating or removing from ethnocentricity or, or kind of being focused on only one culture does open up new avenues for solutions. And I know we do need solutions in our world. Um, and so from that, there is empirical um, evidence that it is important to consider perspectives um, that are not just colonial or just uh, um, kind of this Western concord perspective. Um, but when it comes to dogs, I think this is um, this is a philosophical question that I, I very much agree with. I think that um, we, we generate new ideas, we learn from each other. Um, uh, and exactly like I said, it, it opened my mind. Um, and I think there, um, th this is something that we've, we're learning a lot from my own, our own data even. Yep, thank you. Uh, we've got quite a few more questions. Uh, so I'll just <laughs> okay. go through them. Um, okay. Shall the stress Shelter stress uh, seems to be a response of a dog being in a novel environment. Is it then possible that dogs get used to the shelter environment over time and then is stressful, similarly stressful when it then enters a new home? Mm, wonderful question. Um, uh, it could be, it could be. It's, we don't know. So we, um, there's kind of several parts to this. Uh, so one part is that um, data is showing that, that cortisol responses go down with time uh, and they stay down, except we don't know whether that's habituation to the shelter environment. And so they're actually not stressed anymore um, or it's that dysregulation and they're entering chronic stress. And so during this dysregulation of the HP axis, you do see reduced levels of cortisol in some individuals. You kind of don't know what's happening anymore. It's dysregulated. Um, and so there's a question of, we actually don't know whether they've entered chronic stress. This is just from a research perspective or they've habituated. Um, but I think the answer is never so simple. And I think this is where individual differences have to come in play where um, we shouldn't just be saying dogs or kind of everyone, or all dogs in shelter. Um, again, from our personal experiences, we know there are some dogs that seem to handle the shelter fine. They seem to be okay. And even seem that they're, prefer perhaps a shelter environment in some way if they're not used to a home environment. Um, uh, but, um, but I'm afraid that researchers have not yet really focused on the individual. Uh, we really have focused on group level analyses at the moment. Um, and uh, when we have some individuals that are doing better, some are worse, they average out to zero. And so, um, so we lose um, a lot of uh, important nuance um, and, and so you, you highlight a very important question where I think we need to move into these individualized assessments. Yep. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, is it ever possible to relieve boredom 
for a dog that's in a shelter? Mm, yes, uh, fantastic question. Again, you guys are exactly the questions that I have my, for myself. Um, uh, I struggle to answer this because I think, um, again, maybe for some, yes. And also it depends so much on the shelter's capacity uh, for, um, yeah, just uh, capacity for care. If if the shelter is in a, in a situation where a lot of the shelters that I was kind of part of, uh, where you maybe have 300 dogs and only 12 staff members. In this case, um, certainly you cannot provide care to those animals. They, the animals are, are suffering. Uh, but in a different situation, like for example, at the moment I'm um, involved with the BCSPCA, this is a provincial um, uh, sheltering system in Canada, where uh, we have much many fewer uh, dogs. We don't have so many dogs. And so this allows the staff to really focus in on individualized care for the dogs. And, um, and sometimes we joke certainly that the life of the dogs in their shelter is is it, uh, we would not be able to provide that kind of life in a pet environment <laughs> with all of these. But, but I think, of course, we're joking, but ultimately it depends so much on the shelter capacity. This reminds me of a study by my colleague, um, Dr. Lisa Gunter, um, uh, Erica Furbacher and Clive Wynn, who, um, along with other colleagues, I apologize, I don't remember their, their names, um, their students, um, where they looked at cortisol levels on a short-term foster program. So the dogs would go out into overnight stays um, or even just like visits and come back to the shelter. By the way, speaking of that, um, uh, they, the stress, uh, to, to answer a different question, the cortisol did um, go down over uh, a sleep. Um, a, if it's an overnight stay, the cortisol goes down during that moment, but then comes back to baseline levels when they re-enter the shelter. Um, there is, by the way, different research that says that, yes, as dogs enter the kenneling system, they do get less stress over time repeatedly. Um, uh, sorry, where was I with this? Um, it's a bit late for me. <laughs> I lose my train. I apologize. My train of thought. Um, yes. So they looked at the cortisol levels. Their primary goal was to look at the effect of sleepovers. But what they found was that they enrolled different animal shelters in the, in the, in the study, and they found that the effect of the shelter was bigger than the effect of, the, of the, their intervention. And so the dogs, the baseline levels of cortisol in the various shelters were really big, there were really big differences in those cortisol levels, really suggesting that these kind of uh, larger systems, like larger sheltering systems seem to affect animal welfare dramatically. We don't yet know exactly how that affects. There's been some research on um, uh, cat respiratory disease and various different ways that sheltering systems function that then have this cascading effect and differences in um, illnesses in that shelter. And so, um, and actually my PhD student, Bailey Egan, is currently working on designing a study through the BCSPCA systems where um, looking at the effects of different sheltering styles on, again, cat welfare in the sense um, as well. But I think you're, you're absolutely right. The different shelters um, will have that impact, that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to do things differently, of course, because of resources fundamentally. Yeah. Which, which leads nicely to my next question on, on how important is shelter design to reduce stress uh, and what kind yeah. of features would you look out for or recommend um, for shelters mm -hmm. to have to reduce the stress? Yes. Um, oh gosh, absolutely. It's, um, it's, it's huge. I, um, uh, I'm trying to uh, keep it from to, to a research, what kind of research we have. So we do have some research, uh, we scientists have research on um, uh, looking at other dogs. So dogs are motivated to look at other dogs, but yet barking increases. And so then there's a difficulty where preference and barking is giving us opposite conclusions. And so that one is difficult, whether to allow visual access. Um, but in terms of, um, I have quite a lot to say about design. Uh, fundamentally, not only about the welfare, but also infectious disease. To me, it's all related. Um, in the perfect world, I think we can try to move away from secluding animals in individual cages. I want us to move into a kind of more foster-based, if it has to be a shelter, perhaps the shelter is more um, kind of mimics the human environment more, maybe with rooms where people can go, like living rooms. Um, and so forth, rather than trying to keep it as a kind of a kennel, a traditional kennel environment. But even within a traditional kennel environment, certainly there could be things. And so I don't know, this, this feels like another talk 
Um, <laughs> I think I can tell when we're talking on these things. <laughs> yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I think we only have time for one last question. Uh, so we'll go into, uh, could shelter dog adoption criteria actually also be culturally influenced? Oh, fantastic question. So we are doing, um, this is a whole research line that we have on looking at um, equity, diversity, and inclusion in sheltering. And to us, barriers to adoption is very much related to that. And, and what I mean by that is that um, we, uh, we've published a few papers looking at um, uh, whether we're adopting out um, inequitably to different groups of people in Canada. Um, and, it sound, and it seems like we are, um, are prioritizing certain groups of people. Um, and again, why are we doing that? That's, that's, it's, it's a very deep topic that has a lot of themes within it that deal with um, social justice and human populations. Um, but to answer your question about cultural aspects, absolutely. Uh, we have an example that we teach my students um, in animal sheltering course that I teach is, um, uh, for example, in Sweden, it's illegal to keep your dog in a crate. Whereas in the US, um, a lot of rescues will ask uh, if your dog will sleep in the crate. And if you say no, that will be grounds for not adopting out to you. Um, another example like this with cats um, is in the UK, you can be denied adoption if you say you're going to keep your cats indoors only. Whereas in Canada, you will be denied if you say you're going to allow your cat to go outside. And so all of these things are um, certainly culturally dependent. And, and again, to the point of it's very difficult uh, for us to actually say what is good um, because it's so tied through this lens of the, our human culture. Yep. Thank you so much, Sasha. That's really, really good um, and relevant uh, answers. Uh, thank you so much. And for everyone who submitted a question as well, thank you very much. I'm sorry if we didn't manage to get to all of them. Uh, so we've come to the end of today's webinar on, on animal welfare, and we hope that you've enjoyed yourself and gained some useful insight uh, into this topic. So please head over to our Facebook page, Animal Bus SG, for more educational uh, information on animal ethology and like the page for regular content. Uh, we hope that you can join us for our next talk in May on canine ethology. And uh, if you didn't manage to catch today's session in full, you can also view the recording on our NPARC's SG YouTube page, uh, which you can access by saving and scanning the QR code. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sasha. If you don't mind staying back for a little while. Uh, thank you, everyone else. Uh, have a good day. Thank you, everyone.